Okay. I'm Bill Jacobs. With me are Abby Besrutsik, our Conservation Area Manager, Melody Penny, our Early Detection and Rapid Response Manager, and Cassidy Robinson, our Education and Outreach Manager. If anyone would like to email us, we use our first names at lisma.org. This is today's agenda. We'll start with a LISMA update for about uh, half an hour. Then we'll have roundtable announcements. We'll go around the room here in person, and then we can go around the room remotely. If anyone has a, a brief update related to invasive species, roughly about a minute or less would be good. At 10.35, we have our partner spotlight with Joanne from the National Audubon Society. We'll take a break around 10.50. At 11 o'clock, we have our first presentation. First, the two presentations. First one is Dr. Lair, the impact of global climate change on our landscape plant palette. And then at noon, we have Molly Hassett, also talking about climate change, invasive species carbon and climate change. All right, for the LISMA update, We'll look at some engagement and outreach work that we've been doing recently and also have planned, and then some uh, project tracking and looking back a little bit of what we've been doing and also looking forward. Here's Cassidy to talk about uh, some of our workshops. Hi. All right, so um, kicking off the year, we had our first event in January, our winter tree ID walk with the North Shore Land Alliance. Uh, we began the day with an indoor presentation where we introduced attendees to common plants they'd find in a pitch pine oak forest or woodland uh, like here at the Sisters of St. Joseph uh, and how to identify those plants. Uh, after that presentation, we walked around the trails where our 35 attendees had the opportunity to ask lots of questions and learn how to identify plants in the field. Uh, in these pictures above, you can see us showing off an American holly and a scarlet oak tree and their unique ID characteristics. In February, LISMA presented at the American Fishery Society annual meeting at Stony Brook University. We trained our 53 participants on identification of aquatic invasive plants, as well as their native lookalikes, and how to report those invasives using IMAP invasives. To wrap up the workshop, Abby hosted a friendly competition to see who could identify the most aquatic invasives correctly. It was great to see the audience so engaged and having lots of fun while learning. Uh, last month was also the Long Island Arboricultural Association's annual tree symposium, where LISMA staff discussed the impacts of invasive tree species such as calorie pear and tree of heaven. Our 67 participants learned general management techniques and resources for herbicide information, rounding out another great presentation. So looking back at 2022, LISMA had a really eventful year, jam-packed with field projects from across Long Island, all the way to Montauk, Fishers Island, and hopefully in our next field season beyond. If you're interested in getting a bird's eye view into some of the interesting field work we completed this year and how we seek to protect Long Island's biodiversity, you can scan this QR code here and let us know what you think. Give everyone a second to scan that. I can always go back to it later on if you guys need. <laughs> Thanks, Melody, Bill, and Cassidy. Um, yeah, you should really should check out the annual report. I think it's beautiful and um, so proud of it. So um, now that we're done with the annual report, we're working on our annual action plan for the year. Um, we've been meeting with partners, maybe some of you, uh, on uh, opportunities for collaboration uh, with invasive species across Long Island this year. So we'll just give a brief outline of some of the ideas that we have. We're continuing our water body surveying and management project. Um, so surveying for new infestations in especially priority water bodies that have uh, ecological features that we wanna protect. So continuing down that list, um, we're, we'll be surveying some ponds in Connecticut State Park, Fresh Pond in Hither Hills, Big Reed Pond in Montauk County Park, also the Carmen's River, and maybe some, a uh, few others. Um, trying to 
detect invasive species in these areas before they become large populations. So we're hoping not to find any. Um, we're also continuing our projects in proactive Phragmites management. So especially where Phragmites occurs in really small stands in coastal plain ponds, uh, these rare, uh, you know, threatened ecosystems. We're working to manage Phragmites in those situations. So um, continuing the projects at Long Pond Greenbelt, Sears Bellows County Park, a few ponds there, and also Sandy Pond uh, in the Calverton Ponds Complex. And lastly, we're continuing our project in Libya Pipilides Control. Uh, there's a small population of it in Artist Lake, and um, we are following up monitoring and management there, and uh, with partners at the uh, DEC Region 1 Fisheries. Then uh, that was the water bodies, but also to our terrestrial areas, we're um, doing some surveying of our invasive species prevention zones, uh, namely a few that we haven't been to in a few years, such as the Dwarf Pine Plains, Fire Island National Seashore, David A. Sarnoff Preserve, and also in general assisting in the Southern Pine Beetle response, um, however we can be helpful. Then um, there's also a small stand of swallowwort at Otis Pike State Forest, and we'll be returning there and also adding a new population that we found to that project um, to continue to contain that species and not let it spread too far in that state forest. For 2023, we plan to be on the look, for 2023, we plan to be on the lookout for Laurel wilt and winter moth, monitoring and managing infestations of cinnamon vine in Nassau County, orange candle flower in Staten Island, Ludwigia peploides at Wolf's Pond, Staten Island, and in Artist Lake, Middle Island, and continued monitoring of spotted lanternfly distribution in Suffolk County, as well as perennial pepperweed at West Meadow Beach. Our goals for eradication or containment this year include slender leafy spurge management at the town of Huntington at Crab Meadow Beach, and salt cedar management with the town of Brookhaven at Cedar Beach. All right, now for some upcoming LISMA events. Mark your calendars, because this year's New York Invasive Species Awareness Week is June 5th to 11th. NYSA is a great opportunity to engage the public on invasive species issues statewide by attending events, hosting your own, or co-hosting with LISMA. In the past, there have been events such as webinars, bio blitz, walks, movie showings, social media challenges, mapping games, poster contests, water chestnut pulls, and more. It's quite a lot of going on. Uh, planning for NISAW starts soon, so if you have an idea for NISAW that you'd like to partner with us on, please let us know. Uh, we also have some other great events coming up in the next few months. First, we're hosting a Phragmites workshop to discuss some successes and pitfalls for management, uh, details TBA, TBD. Um, next, for all of April, we'll be celebrating Earth Month in a few different ways. Lisbo, Lisma will be tabling at the Quag Wildlife Refuge Earth Day celebration on Earth Day. Um, April 20th is the Long Island Natural History Conference, which is a very cool event. If you haven't been before, uh, we will probably be there. Um, there will also be a PRISM-wide social media campaign, so keep your eyes out for Lisma on Instagram and Facebook if you don't already follow us. Um, and yeah, and follow for more updates. Um, on, in May, we'll be tabling on May 9th or 11th at the Farmingdale Plant Sale. Um, and New York Invasive Species Awareness Week, as I said, is June 5th to 11th, and stay tuned for updates on that. And last, mark your calendars for the next partners meeting on May 26th. All right, now we'll have a round table announcements. We'll start in the room here. And if folks could say their name and if they're with an organization, what organization they're with. And you can either just say hello or if you have an invasive update, you can you can do that now. So let's start with Sabrina. <laughs> We'll be gearing up for our shows coming up uh, with the Southern Pine Beetle and um, some of our restoration sites. So, yeah. So, I'm going to have to make you go to the top of that. It's a little bit of a fan. Also, it's a lot of fun. 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 Uh, my name is Roland Palomino. I am the assistant landscape ecologist here at the Sisters. 
Uh, we have some grants coming through this spring, in which we will finally be able to tackle our landless population here. I'm very much looking forward to that. And fortunately, that we had to sneak in another cutting before the deadline for a lot of years that. Yes. We had to cut down 75 infested and barrier trees. You can see it's other five people on our forms. And Amanda Furtall, Director of Ecological and Sustainability here in Sustainability. And yeah, I think Nolan pretty much got everything. And just thinking about over the last year, I want to thank Lisma again for um, the subcontractor work on the Linden Library in the Woodlands, um, especially as we're cutting for Southern Pine Beetle, managing those invasive uh, viburnums and other understory things that come in when we open up the canopy. It's been really helpful, and that our monitoring strong enough can really affect it. So. Great. 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 All right. Thank you. Uh, I am Charlotte Brennan. I'm from Northern Nine Lines. Uh, one cool and amazing project that we started recently is the uh, the summit canceled the game of the Bobcat of the Tanshin stand. We have one of our other mountain meadows and rolling that. Um, we only with the stuff we see that we have a little bit of the game source that we see what we can adopt in the uh, that. Great, thanks. Good morning. My name is Sarah. I'm the nurse who has been specialist at Cornell Cooperative Center with the county. And uh, I don't really have updates in terms of things to speak to you, but that's not really my role. But I do want to provide some form of education that we, it was a June 5th, 11th, the amazing speech you can Yes. Yeah, so hopefully it can be time. Great. All right, thank you. Uh, uh, so I have been the last year or two, I've not just I've been working on the quality of the All right, thank you, Bill. Hi, Chris Scott, I'm a environmental engineer with Tiff Rose Consulting. It's starting to be late. I do represent a number of municipalities who have issues with some. Lakes and then trying to rehab the lakes uh, having to do with invasive species throughout the county and that's a county. So I just try to learn a little bit more and then see what I can do with it and all the public supplies. Great. Welcome. In the back, do you want to introduce yourselves and do you have any updates on invasive species? Or... Uh, I'm just Pat Harrell. I also work with the DW Gross Consulting. I assist Chris on a Number of projects where we're doing with the basic uh, species in aquatic settings and uh, thinking about more. All right, great. Nick Russell, also a field investor. We're Matt Fenn, we're with Matt and Chris. Not good to see you all. And oh. Uh, I'm going to go to the Yamaha from the Forest Audubon Society, um, the president of the field and the um, the Audubon Society and the Department of Amazon Park and Reserve are big initiatives, and we're in the permitting process to go out to Young Island to remove all the land that's proactive. Uh, first of all, the applies with us an outbreak from the island because no one goes on the island and then spread it. No, thank you. And in the front. Sure. <laughs> My name is Andy Marcel. I'm with Safe the Great South Bay. Uh, part of the work we do uh, is uh, defending the creeks that empty into Great South Bay. So we're uh, literally uh, got our boots on the ground. We uh, encounter invasive species along the shoreline in the creeks uh, and around the creeks. Uh, this would be uh, useful to us to help get a grip on uh, the priority species to keep an eye out for. Yes. I'm also uh, with Save the Great South Bay. My name is Tom King. Um, I'm on the board of directors and uh, director of the Creek Defender Program uh, and the Creek Defender of Bayshore. And again, this is just the trying to get educated as to what we're looking for and identify. So. All right, sounds good. Well, thank you, everybody in the room. I think we have everybody in the room. And let's go to our remote participants let's see I'm gonna click on time so we probably should get through I can call people out that might be the easiest but by uh, most of my first name but Jack Schneider do you have an update 
Yeah, good morning. This is Jack Schneider. I'm the stewardship coordinator at the Henry L. Ferguson Museum Land Trust. And uh, subsequent to uh, Haley and the other staff at LISMA's visit and, the, and a survey of two of our properties, um, we've received some funding to um, remove invasive species from the Chaco Mount Cove uh, property, which, which was surveyed last summer. Um, we're also uh, going ahead with our uh, uh, black swallowwort uh, efforts to try to remove black swallowwort and um, also working on our beech leaf disease problem. So that's it for me. All right, thank you, Jack. Agatha? Hello, good morning. Um, I'm Agatha, I'm the owner and president of Martin Gardens. We are a regenerative landscaping company. Uh, we've been, you know, just learning about the actions. It's my first time here and learning about the work of Lisma and working, you know, towards eradicating invasives in my landscapes. Thank you, Agatha. Next up is Anne. Hey. Don't know the last name, but if you're Anne, now's your chance. Anne, going once. We can't hear you. We'll we'll come back to you, Anthony Valentino. Hi, I'm uh, Anthony Valentino with the Town of Babylon DEC. Um, we've been finding uh, pretty decent populations of spotted lanternfly, especially at our landfill. Um, I'm with Vinny Biondo on the call, so he probably has a little bit more knowledge of it, but that's a, that's our scenario. Thanks. All right, thank you. Brooke Shellman. Hi, my name is Brooke Shellman, and I'm a biological science technician with the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, we're currently working on, like, things that I'm excited for would be creating invasive species volunteer work days at the refuge. And I also like to do um, training workshops for individuals interested in volunteering for identification and management of invasives. I like to attend these meetings to see what I should keep an eye out for and also to hopefully make some more partnerships. Great, thank you. Next up is Carol Isles. Good morning. Um, my name is Carol Isles. I'm the administrative director for LINLA, which is the Long Island Nursery Landscape Association. Uh, big fan of the organization. Come to the uh, uh, the tree walk in uh, uh, this winter. It was very good. Uh, but uh, in my capacity with LINLA, I'm on the call because I wanted to see if there's ways that the professional community as boots on the ground on both commercial and residential properties uh, could be, you know, the eyes for LISMA as far as identification, what type of information we can disseminate to our members, and uh, what kind of feedback we can give back to uh, to LISMA. Oh, that sounds good, Carol. Can we, we'll get in touch with you. And Surely. Talk. All right, thank you. Coal Environmental Services. Anyone there from Coal? How about David Grigg? Hey, good morning. I'm uh, an architect and just an interested uh, neutral party. I'm very uh, supportive of your activities, but I'm not uh, a landscape or uh, arbor specialist. All right, thank you, David. Dawn Frawley. All right, we have Kate Stevens. And we have, do you want to read that from? Yeah, I uh, just went, Cole Environmental yeah. Services said they don't have a microphone, but they're an environmental consulting firm helping homeowners acquire permits with a focus on sustainable development and removal of invasive species. Just want to pass that along. All right, thank you. Kate, Kate Stevens. Kate, and uh, the next one, I hope I say it right, Mai, M-E-I. 
Hi, that's May, like the month of May. May. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm just an interested uh, party, and thank you for letting me join. Um, I'm very interested in the topic, so this is very helpful for me to know what's coming up and who's doing what and who's seeing what. So thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Glad you're here. And we have a Steve, but it's not Steve Young. Steve Young is after Steve. Uh, Bill, I don't know if that's Steve Pearson. Oh, that it, yeah, it could be you. Sure. It's sure. You. So, all right, Stephen Pearson here with the New York State DEC. I am, I guess, uh, Long Island Lisma related updates would be the Peconic River Ludwigia uh, control project is uh, slated occur again here in 2023. This will be the second year of full-scale treatment uh, between Connecticut Ave and, uh, and Riverhead. Um, the treatments will be based on the post-treatment surveys from last fall, as well as uh, pre-treatment surveys from this coming summer. That's all, all those contracts are in place. Uh, permitting is ongoing and should be in place by that time. We have the Article 24 permit is good for five years. We received that last year. And the Article 25 permit uh, has been submitted uh, for that as well as some other uh, permitting processes. So that's ongoing. And that's um, for Lawigia control some, uh, across the Peconic as well as European project. Uh, in, in addition to that, uh, from the uh, LIMACE group, that's the Long Island, New York City metro, uh, metro area, uh, Aquatic Invasive Species um, Task Force. Uh, in 2022, we developed a marine species uh, guide for invasives and, and native lookalikes, and we were able to have those printed. So I do have I believe we have a hundred of them and we're looking to disseminate them to uh, folks who will be out in the field. So I've been in contact with uh, Meg McCormick uh, who helped develop that to put the list of people together and then we'll see where we are with remaining um, remaining books for distribution. Oh, that's great, Steve. Yeah, thanks, Bill. That's my There's opinion. probably a couple of people right here that would want one, including Lisma. Oh yeah, I think Liz, Liz was on the list for sure. But yeah, so if you can think about uh, folks who are outside of the DC who might be working in the marine uh, realm, uh, let us know. All right, great, thank you. Steve Young, hi Steve. Hi Lizma and everyone. I'll be doing some field work through the summer uh, in Nassau County this year and which includes documenting invasive species. So looking forward to that. Steve, can you let us know when you're around? I know we, we have new staff that would love to meet you. Yeah, I'll, I'll make sure I get over and okay. And I'll be at the I'll be at the Long Island uh, Natural History Conference too. All right, great. All right, thanks. Tom DeMeo. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Um, just want to mention one one interesting project that we had that just passed. Uh, Rutgers and the DOT partnered up and did an eDNA um, study, and they, they were looking for SLF uh, along 495 all the way out to Orient Point, and they pretty much found positives all along the way, even though they didn't really find any um, adults or egg masses. So. Uh, just because you're not seeing it, chances are it's 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 in the area all across Long Island. So we're going to be doing a lot more surveys this this year. All right, thank you, Tom. Tim Wenskis. Uh, good morning. I'm Tim Wenskis. I'm the DEC forester for the New York City region. Uh, I have no updates for today. All right, thanks, Tim. Vincent. Hey, good morning, uh, Vinny Biondo, Town of Babylon, Department of Environmental Control. Um, just here for uh, ed further educate about uh, any public outreach I can give residents. Um, also, as Anthony Valentino mentioned before, 
uh, USDA found 14,000 egg masses at our landfill and removed them. So looking forward to seeing what happens out in the spring there, which is going to be great. All right. Thank you. Thank you. There's someone on a phone. We only have one person on a phone. So if you're on a phone, it could be you. <laughs> and you're muted. All right, then uh, Kate, did Kate go? And then we can go back to Anne and try Anne again. Kate? No Kate. And uh, is there Anne? Anne there? Yes, right. hi, good morning. Oh, there you are, hi. My name is Ann Road. I'm with the uh, New York State Department of Agriculture. Um, one recent uh, maybe update that some of you may be aware of with the spotted lanternfly, um, and not surprising, it um, has been seen in the Massapequa Preserve. Uh, so it's probably extended from the infestation that was up in Farmingdale and Melville. Um, but that was just one thing that I became aware of uh, just recently. Okay. And I, I'm a guest. This is the first time I've attended the meeting here. Oh, I'm glad you're here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Did I get everyone? There's an Amanda. I don't know if we got Amanda. Hi, Bill. Uh, this is Amanda Loth with PW Grocer Consulting. I joined a little late. Sorry about that. Um, I'm just, I'm on for information. Um, I've attended past roundtables and it's been very helpful. I do a lot of the waterfront um, work with Chris Omskog and Nick Russell at our site. All right. Hi, Amanda, by the way, and uh, glad you're here. Anybody else out there that didn't get a chance? Okay. Well, thank you for the announcements. And my slide won't advance. Oh, here we go. All right, let's go to our, do we break now or do we break after the partner spotlight? After, okay, let's go to our partner spotlight. Melody's going to introduce Joy Ann. Joy is the proprietor of Joy's Forever Endeavor an ecological garden design and mentoring company for residential, commercial, and municipal managed landscapes focusing on native plants and the environmental services they provide. She is an ecosystem specialist, environmental educator, and natural historian. Joy has been involved with all levels of the Audubon Society since 2010. She has held the position of president of her local chapter, Four Harbors Audubon Society from 2016 to 2023. <laughs> She was, awarded, <clears throat> she was awarded the National Audubon Society's coveted William Dutcher Award for Conservation Excellence as the Na National Audubon Convention in Wil Milwaukee, Wyoming in 2019. She is currently the board chair for the Audubon Council of New York State and the director of the Board of Audubon New York. Her Audubon focus matches her career focus with boots on the ground work in ecosystem connectivity and functionality, conservation, plants for birds and bird friendly community initiatives, coastal resiliency work and advocacy. Joy is currently endeavoring to launch an ecological landscape professional endorsement program for Audubon New York and Connecticut. Joy believes that education and the next generation are the keys to repairing the environmental issues the world faces. Thank you, and here's Joy. <laughs> Pardon me, sorry, I need my water. Um, my stopwatch on. Um, I met Melody actually at um, the sanctuary. She had wanted to get some hands-on um, some hands-on experience with both invasive species and native plants. So what we, um, I teach a mentoring program out of Theodore Roosevelt Sanctuary and Audubon Center. So um, just hang on a minute while we get the uh, presentation up. We're almost there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yay. Okay, and then into... Yes, you want to get to your yeah. presenter. So um, Theodore Roosevelt Sanctuary and Audubon Center, um, they're going to be celebrating their 100th anniversary on May 21st. So it's been around for 100 years. Um, it was donated by the Roosevelt family. Theodore Roosevelt actually resides. Um, how do I change the slides? <laughs> Is it just uh, one of those? 
that one. Okay. Yep. And to go backwards, this one. Okay, yep. good. Um, <laughs> sorry, a little technical difficulty here. And I only get 15 minutes. Um, so when when Melody asked me to do this, um, you know, could we possibly uh, do um, the powers and pitfalls of restoring native habitat um, using the sanctuary as a model? I said, this is terrific. Sure, great. Uh, let's do that. Um, and again, the the um, the center's been there for a hundred years. Um, there's 14 acres. Three and a half of those acres are now um, native habitat. So we, we've restored it back to a teaching garden and a display garden. Um, and it comes with a lot of benefits, but it also comes with a lot of caveats. Um, it was put in four years ago. I was there from the inception. Um, I got to look at the designs. MA did the design work, um, and I'm pretty sure it was MA. And um, um, Kelco did the install. And from there, we basically do it managing it with volunteers. So it's really interesting. The first thing we had to do was we had to rip down all of the buildings that were in the way of the site uh, on the three and a half acres. So those came down. Um, you can see the boxes around the trees where we protected the tree roots because we want those native trees in there. We removed all the invasive species, cleared off the soil. Um, heavy equipment came in to do a rip out and a site prep for the three and a half acres. And with that came some issues um, because on the side of the slope where the white house is, it slopes down um, and in the back, it also slopes down. So everything falls into this nice little beautiful ravine. Um, again, natural historian for me, it's like, okay, glacial moraine slides all the way down this hill and then down out into the street. So we needed to get rid of the invasive species, not just in the area where we're planting, but on the hillsides because it's gonna wind up coming down. So so uh, English ivy, um, pachysandra, uh, vinca, mm, garlic mustard, you name it, basically it's in there, including, um, but not limited to, um, the um, Aurelius uh, spinosissimus, I think, is the devil's walking stick. So that's always fun to pull out. Um, so we had master gardeners right there, and we also had student volunteers that came in to help us. But unfortunately, it was a little bit too much for all of us to do. Um, and again, this is a sanctuary. We cannot use chemicals. We will not use chemicals. We need to use native species and we need to do things either manually or with biocontrols because um, it's a habitat. It's the first songbird sanctuary in the United States. Uh, and it was started 100 years ago by the Audubon Society. So um, we hired these guys. And they came in and they ate everything. Um, and they finally got to the ivy because they, they eat everything, but they, they don't really prefer ivy. So the only time that they'll eat ivy is once they're finally finished everything else. But they did a really good job. The design itself, um, again, native species, uh, really, really wonderful um, habitat. Uh, the plan was absolutely beautiful. We did bulk up uh, because there wasn't enough biodiversity in the plant species. So we pushed the biodiversity up a little bit by adding some more species while still sticking to the design. Um, in addition to the local native species, we added Southern variants and Southern species because we know climate is gonna be an issue in the next 10, 15, 20 years. And I'm sure Anthony, uh, not Anthony, excuse me, John Jonathan Lerner is probably going to be going over that um, soon, um, but basically plan for that. Don't use sugar maple. Don't use um, hemlock, things like that. We, we avoided those and we put in the more southern species. So we do have um, Cali Pepper Americana, which is American Beautyberry, Itea Virgin, uh, Virginiana, which is uh, Virginia Sweet Spire, and other plants like coneflower that are not native to the area, but they will be eventually, like in the next 10 or 15 years. And this is where we drew our line. We also, even though it wasn't budgeted for, and again, a, a nonprofit, we don't have much money, um, so even though it's a huge society, uh, supposedly, we the money funnels down from national, we also get donations, but um, if there wasn't enough in the budget for a sprinkler system, but a sprinkler system is very important. So we managed to find the funding for the sprinkler system, and it was a good thing we put it in because the plants take about a year or two, three years, three years to establish. So you really, if you're going to do a project of this magnitude, you want a sprinkler system or an irrigation system. Uh, we were really happy that we had it last year when we had that three and a half to four week drought because we watered once a week. Um, <laughs> <laughs> heavily once a week. Um, the bad thing, though, is with all this heavy equipment driving around, it's crushing, it crushed the, um, the clay layer in the soil and compacted it. And in addition, there may be either a spring or the fact that, again, glacial moraine, the ravine comes down straight through the middle of the garden. And what wound up happening was they planned for mesic species, they planned for um, dry, dryland upland species, 
And we now had a facultative, a, a facultative wetland to actually almost obligate wetland species that needed to be in there. So they chose the wrong plants. So the native plants that we chose like goldenrod that grow in the shade, zigzag goldenrod, et cetera, um, and the, what is it, Monarda fistulosa, they died because it was too wet. So this is again, a teaching garden, wonderful experience to have this, but now there's giant open spaces in the garden, what do you do? And of course, weed seeds blow in um, and we don't have not weed on the property. So as soon as we saw this, we pulled it out. Um, the, the Kusa dogwood, which we left in, and that was a mistake, um, we are probably going to remove it in the next year or two. Um, it decided that that year, 2019 was its last year, dropped all of its seeds. Um, about 10,000, 15,000 had to be pulled out by hand. And um, additionally, when you have a volunteer group, sometimes you don't get there, sometimes it rains, um, and unfortunately these weeds have to be pulled up before they go to seed, or you create a seed bank. And so now we have a little bit of a seed bank in some certain areas. So um, we have, what is that, silk grass, uh, garlic mustard, and some bird must have pooped out a... Um, Ah, uh, recursive thorns, what is that? Mile minute vine. Um, so the mile minute vine is in there. Um, it's not on the property anywhere, so we don't know where it came from, but you know, again, plants migrate, so these migrated in. Um, they're all annuals. And if you can stop the seed bank from growing, um, if you can get each one of these to not let its seeds go, you're saving 200 more plants next year, or three or four or five, depending on how many they make. Annuals generally tend to make more seeds because that's their, their life goal, is to make more of themselves. So um, we pulled those out. We also have the native smart weed in there. Um, but you know, again, it can get a little aggressive if it has a nice big open area that's nice and damp. So it was very happy. When you plant in big drifts, it's also very useful for your volunteer group to find the plants that they need. But the problem that you have with planting in drifts is you have um, issues like, like this. Um, the columbine softly can find the columbine. We also discovered that the columbine that we were using was not native columbine. It was a crossbreed that they sold us. And unfortunately, we were very unhappy about that because the softly actually prefers um, the non-native species, not the native species. So um, it was defoliated. We also have um, viburnum leaf beetles because once again, we're planting in masses um, and they can find it very easily. There is a two or three in that one. There's, I don't know, seven, eight, nine or in that one, um, that photo, uh, the circle right there. So viburnum leaf beetle is an issue. Um, the second spring when things were setting up, unfortunately what wound up happening was we, um, we had uh, a little bit of an issue there with uh, a cold wet spring. Cold wet springs basically bring um, whatever is in the soil out of the soil into the tree and plant roots. So we had unfortunately um, an outbreak of one of the funguses um, in our, what was it? The um, the coral bells right there and also the uh, Phlox solanifera that basically, and once again, you're planting in patches so it can wipe out the entire patch. So try and do smaller patches if you're gonna do a project like this. Um, and then we have this wonderful guy that I brought down to the, uh, <laughs> which no one has talked about here, but we have a maintenance program for this there. Um, this is a, a, a worm, and it's a very specific type of species of worm. Um, Worms are not supposed to be on Long Island. Glaciers actually removed them uh, 10,000 years ago. And when they receded, the worms were pushed all the way south and extirpated from um, all the way down until the Carolinas. So um, gardeners love worms. We add worms in. Um, and red wigglers are fine. They don't eat that much in the way of, um, you know, they, they do, but they break down the soil and their fresh is very wonderful for the soil. But um, night crawlers are worse so they can spread three or four acres in a year. And these these guys are the worst because they go about 17 acres in a year. They create the soil, they call it popcorn soil. The nutrients are locked up in the soil. Um, and it seems to be almost waterproof at times. So water doesn't really penetrate. And unfortunately, this is really bad for plant root systems. So if you couple this with the problems with a, a cold, wet spring, um, you wind up with plant diseases that the capillaries on the roots aren't growing and you can pull these things right up out of the ground. So um, it was really kind of frustrating to have this happen. Um, this is is what they look like. Have we got a touch screen here? Here we go. Um, you can you can identify them by the way they move. They don't use peristalsis. They actually slither like snakes. Um, you can also, whoops, where'd I go here? Um, they call them this for a reason. They are jumping worms. When you irritate them, they bounce around. So these are Asian jumping worms. And we have a really big colony of Asian jumping worms. 
So unfortunately, that is an issue. Back to this one. Oh, we're using the old slide presentation. I already talked about this, so we're going to go on. Um, last but not least, we do have some of the megafauna issues. Um, and these are native, but they can be pestiferous and invasive. So we're going to call them aggressive, or uh, I'm going to call them invasive. Sorry. Um, so we have voles, and we also have the occasional deer. And now I'm going to talk about all the different solves and the way that you handle these things and also the success story and the power of this kind of a garden because it's a native plant garden. So we're, we're giving back um, biodiversity and habitat for these, these creatures and for us to keep us healthy. The first thing we did after the garden was put in was we, we installed a deer fence, um, keeps Bambi out and, and all of his friends. Um, they do get in, unfortunately, because sometimes they leave the gate open. Um, people leave the gate open and they wander in and there's a, a water fountain in there for them um, just in case, but they drink out of the fountain. So um, for the voles, we use owls. Um, we we put a couple of owl boxes up in the gardens themselves to try and bring the owls in. We will never ever, and I am strongly against rodenticides because when the rodent when the when the rodents eat the rodenticides, it's actually a blood thinner. It's it's warfarin or something in that same vein. So they bleed out. So when you when you bruise them, um, you know normally if if you have um, high blood pressure, they give you blood thinners because they don't want you to have clots. Um, and so this is the same the same drug, except in in mass quantities. These in, uh, these animals eat that and they die, but they they bleed out first. So you're talking about subdural hematoma. Really not a fun way to go. But if they don't eat enough of it, and you have an owl in there and they're eating two or three of these a day. It builds up in their system and they die the same way. So never, ever, ever use rodenticides. Um, in the wetter areas, we used, um, again, facultative, uh, facultative wetlands. So facultative, we've used plants that will tolerate a little bit more moisture. And for the obligate wetland, which we do in fact have, I can walk through there any time of the year and I squish in the mud. Um, cardinal flower, mallow. Um, we even have a little stand of small cattail in there. Um, for, the, for the jumping worms, we have uh, volunteers that come in to collect them. These little cups right here were given to the Navy um, when they came in to do a volunteer project. And the, the incentive was, if you, whoever collects the most worms in the container, actually not the most worms, but the most biomass of worms and drown them in those containers, wins the pizza. The woman in the middle with the turtle in her hand, she won the pizza. Huh. Um, so works out really well. It really knocked the numbers down. You can also do a mustard pour to get rid of the worms. Um, and that really wow. does well. Um, with the gardens themselves, because there were open areas, we actually let some of the more invasive natives come in, um, so or aggressive natives. So we use poverty rush in the circle right over here. The Navy pulled that out when we put the pygnanthum in. But we used that poverty rush to hold the spot so that we didn't have to weed as much. And I, we kept the, the, the poverty rush in control by, you can gather it because it grows in clumps, snip off the top of the head, get all the seed heads, put them in a bag, get rid of them, and then leave the poverty rush where it is. So we never, didn't let them seed for those three years. When we finally had enough in our budget to be able to buy more plants for the area, we, uh, we pulled them out with the Navy, and that's when they, they collected lots of the worms. So <laughs> it worked out very well. When you have a beautiful garden like this, it's always in flower because you've timed all the different flowers to time at different uh, to flower at different times of the year. You wind up getting really interesting uh, pollinators. So you get things like uh, thread wasted wasps and, and stuff like that. By not using pesticides, you get amphibians. Amphibians are a biological indicator. So we have these on the premises. This one was actually a baby from the fountain because tree frogs can get into the fountain, but nobody else can. So we also have wood frogs because there are no fish in the pond in the back, um, and we also have have, again, megafauna like turtles, box turtles, etc. The pollinators are amazing. Um, you, we have a lot of um, pollinators in the garden uh, pollinating. And again, this is not a, a strict native to Long Island plant, but you can see the movement, all the different bees and things going on in this photograph on the coneflower. And the reason that we have so much is because we manage the, the ground. Um, the duff layer is really important to those, um, the winter hibernating bees and also moths. When you gather up the leaves and you take them away, you're taking away a lot of, um, I'm going to say butterfly and moth pupas. Um, they live in the duff layer. Additionally, in the stalks, um, you have pollinators hibernating in the hollow stems. So you want to leave these on the premises because that's where your next generation of, of bees and pollinators are going to be coming from. And yes, there can be pest insects in there too, um, but you're better off. And when the place is in balance, you don't have an issue. Um, with a garden like this, it's wonderful because people walk in. The white building right there is now going to be the nature center. Um, they just finally finished. We're, we're actually, we're in the finishing um, 
I think it's going to be done by by April um, to, to get this done. And by May, we're going to be doing the ribbon cutting ceremony for the new nature center. The, the, the staff was magnificent. They actually had their summer camp outside three years in a row, working from a tent um, and bringing in a trailer for the for the bathroom. So teaching gardens like this are phenomenal because they show us what works, what doesn't work, um, hands on experience that uh, Melody managed to get hold of. Um, and I am there on Fridays, every Friday from um, in the growing season from spring until fall. Um, sometimes I bake pies and cakes. If you want to learn more about this, you are more than welcome to join us. And if you volunteer to pull out some of those annoying weeds, I will answer any questions you have about these different things. Um, but for now, I'm just going to take questions here. So, Mina. The <laughs> Um, it took them a couple of months, and unfortunately, I don't know the cost because um, I am not staff. <laughs> um, but I think someone on is on. Her, her name is Amanda, um, and I, probably Julie or somebody else is there. But we can ask them, and I'll, I'll find out and I get you the information. Um, and it took about, I think, a couple of months. I moved them around a little bit, so because it was a, a kind of a large area. Um, but it was it was a couple of months worth of, of work, and they worked their way down to the ivy, but they got rid of it. So yeah, anybody else? Wow, cool. Oh, hi. Insect pests or, you know, things attacking some of the natives. And it seemed like a lot of them were, were native insects, but they're defoliating things. How much of an issue were you finding that? Does it seem like it's maybe a one year kind of cyclical thing and then the plants will kind of? What, um, the sawfly actually, the viburnum leaf beetle, I'm pretty sure are not native, um, and I'm pretty sure they brought them in with the with the the columbine sawfly. I'm pretty sure it came in with the British columbine, so it prefers that instead of ours. Um, and some years they're worse than others. Um, if you can get them in control before they become adults, obviously you uh, you spray and we use neem. Um, so, but we use what they call targeted pest management with organic principles. So we'll use neem. Um, I, you can't use, um, what is it, uh, Bacillus thuringianus uh, because it's a saw fly. So you, if you see, oh my goodness, there's caterpillars on this. I need to dose this with Bacillus because that's organic. You will kill every single caterpillar in your yard but you will not kill a sawfly larva and they will continue to, to exfoliate your mallow uh, or whatever they're on. So sawflies are not the same insect as, as uh, butterflies and moths. They're, 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 the ones are lepidoptera and the other ones are, again, sawflies. So yeah, um, but we there's recurring cycles. If you can break the cycle, it's better. The same thing with weeding. If you can get in there, uh, and again, the way that you weed is um, the cold weather weeds like bittercress um, and you know those other, the ones that germinate over the winter or in the fall, for the spring, you pull those out by the time the dandelions finish flowering before they go to seed. That gets rid of that seed bank. For the cool weather weeds that germinate in March, April, you pull out by a Memorial Day, so right before the summer starts. Um, and then for the warm weather weeds, um, like the, the warm weather grasses, etc., you try and get those out by the 4th of July, because if you don't, once again, they're going to set seeds and then your seed bank explodes. Um, and it's at, basically, it's what do they call that when it goes up on a, on a scale? Yeah, exponential. So you you want to get as many of those out as you possibly can before they go to seed. So if you work with a volunteer base, that's what you want to do. Yes. The southern natives, did they make it through a year? Mm -hmm. Yeah. They they came back. The uh, the idea is actually doing very very well. It's about this tall right now. I have to prune it back down again because we want to be able to see the vista. Yes. Uh, because we're a small nonprofit, we're only Sorry. looking for funding. On Curious, uh, what are your funding sources? Um, we have large donors. We have grants that we write. Um, we now have the open space. Uh, what was it? The, they just passed the, um, what is it? Um, uh, Hochul in New York State. So we have the Open Space Bond Act. There's money out there for that. Um, NIFWIF grants, things like that. Um, there, there's a lot of money out there. And, and again, if you can, if you're allowed to, because unfortunately with the National Audubon Society, um, we're not really allowed to crowdfund, but the smaller the smaller places can crowdfund too. So if you put it out there, we need this for this. A lot of people like to donate 
to specific things instead of just like, oh, let's just give to them. Um, if you have a project that you want to do and you put it out there on, let's say, Giving Tuesday, um, we're going to probably start doing things um, the first week of May because that's the bird migration time. So it's like, let's do a fundraiser then. Yeah, let's go birding together and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll do a birdathon and bring in money that way. But there's so many different ways. And if you want to, <laughs> you, and I, you and I can talk later. So that'll be good. Anybody else? We're good. Thank you, Joanne. Looks like an amazing project.